I first just wanted to say thanks to Outright. Um, they've done an incredible job today bringing us all here together, as well as the entire week. And so I just want to first and foremost thank Outright for everything they've been doing and they continue to do. Um, Second, the panel, thank you very much for being here. We're very excited for your insights and your strategies, and we have a lot to, to discuss. Um, and all of you, thank you again for being here. Um, we're really excited about the movement. It's mo more important than ever, and so thank you again uh, for being here. Again, my name is Alap Shah. I'm happy to be the moderator. I'm going to try to stay out as much as possible and let the panel um, do the talking. But I did want to just give a, a couple of remarks. I, I know this past month has been very difficult for, for many of us. Um, a lot of sadness, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty. And I know for many of us, um, this new reality is not normal. And, I, and I, I'll say that one thing I do wanna make sure we talk about is that although it's new for many of us in America and maybe Europe, it's not new. This is a reality for decades in many countries who faced um, some of the most you know, difficult situations. And so this isn't a new reality, this has been their reality for a long time. And so I'd love to listen to what they have um, to share for us. Um, and so I hope we can, you know, come away with some strategies and some inspiration and some positive constructive um, opportunities for us to go home with. So I'll uh, we'll love everyone to kind of just take 20, 30 seconds and introduce yourselves and where you work, and then we'll kind of jump right into the questions. So, Jael? Um, I'm Jael, Deri legally Derisia Castillo-Salazar from Belize. I'm representing Our Circle, a civil society organization that works towards the inclusion and visibility of the LGBT people in Belize from a social and a political standpoint. Yeah. This is on, yes. Hi, I'm Teek Milan. Uh, I'm a New York based, New York and Toronto based uh, writer and strategic media consultant. Uh, I write for CNN, BuzzFeed, NBC, New York Times. Uh, and I'm trans, hey, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Ricky Nathanson. Um, I am with the Trans Research, Education, Advocacy and Training um, TREAT in Zimbabwe. I also am the Southern Africa Trans Forum Secretary and with the All Africa Trans and Intersex Committee. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cliff Cortez, and I'm the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Advisor at the World Bank based in Washington, D.C., which is a brand new position, and so the first time they've had somebody like me in that position. And before that, just recently, I came from the UN system where I was with UN Development Program, UNDP, working on issues of sexual orientation, gender identity rights, and inclusive development. Good afternoon, my name is Miriam van der Haaf. I live in the Netherlands. I'm the co-chair for OI Europe, which stands for Organization Intersex International Europe. And I was recently elected uh, elected uh, to the ILCA board uh, to represent the Intersex Secretariat. That's great, thank you very much. Uh, so the first couple of questions I'm gonna ask, kind of open-ended, so anybody who wants to answer it, feel free to, um, and we'll get to a couple of questions that are more specific to each of you after that. So I think the first question I'd love to ask anybody, or, or all of you, is um, you know, what was your initial reaction after the US election? <laughs> Yes, please. All of us. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> coming coming from um, uh, an African perspective, um, we were extremely, extremely shocked and disappointed um, after hearing the utterances um, by by the the president elect um, on on his immigration policies and his basic um, views on on people that are of other eth ethnic races, uh, we, we, we really were shocked and extremely disappointed. Um, you know, uh, November 9th, I went and got a condo in Toronto. That was my, uh, <laughs> I, swear, I swear to God, I did. 
uh, that was my reaction to 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 the to the election. Um, you know, but for for me, it was, uh, it was it was it was more it was more so about what the what Donald Trump's winning says about the culture of this country, um, and and how we are in these echo chambers and we are constantly just talking to each other, um, you know, and reiterating our own types of ideas and ideologies and not understanding what's happening with other people. Um, and it really um, really reinformed me that the vile racism and sexism that has been a part of this country's fabric is still alive and vibrant. Um, and it was a much, much needed wake up call for me as a media professional. I think that's an interesting point. Uh, I imagine maybe to the others, what do you expect is gonna happen, let's say a year from now? Do you think it's gonna be the same? Um, any thoughts? Because I think there's so much uncertainty right now of how the administration is going to be acting. So, any thoughts of, or you know, prophecy? <laughs> I th I think we could, we uh, it's going to be hard to predict, right? Because one of the issues that's important for the international presence of the U.S. in policy is going to be the, who they choose as the Secretary of State, and then who then gets chosen as the head of USAID in terms of middle income and low income partnerships. Uh, country partnerships. So we have to wait and see on that. But as a general matter, uh, we know that the the new incoming vice president uh, is one of the most anti-LGBT politicians uh, that holds a governorship in the United States. Uh, and so I think we have to be realistic and assume that we're going to see changed positions by the U.S. government, um, at least not backing away from full-throated support that we've gotten used to in the Obama years. Uh, and so I think our strategies have to begin to take that into account. Well, and Dial, I was going to ask you, I mean, you know, being from the Caribbean, um, what are the biggest changes that you've seen even in the past couple of weeks since the election? I think for us it was um, really slow hitting us because we did uh, tune in to what was happening. We did enjoy the comedy that was occurring throughout the campaign. Um, the elections were held, and I think for us as, as Caribbeans, the biggest thing we had on our mind was, oh my gosh, my auntie coming back home, my uncle coming back home, <laughs> everybody coming back home. Um, <laughs> so that, that was actually our, our biggest thing. How will everyone fit in this house that we have? So first thing, that, that I mean, yeah, we laughed about it as well until we realized that it goes back to an old saying that if America sneezes, the Caribbean catches a cold. So it, it, for us, while it was just a sneeze from America, it hit us really hard because we, real, we, we know that a lot of our funding, a lot of our, our support, a lot of our development comes yeah. through the United States. And I think personally, for me, it hit me hard because I know... For instance, in Belize, we have a very small trans population. But I know there are some people in here who would probably know Eric, Erica Castellanos. She's one of my best friends. And the first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, how long is she going to live now? That was the first thing that came to my mind. Because, of course, majority of what she's been through has been funded through the United States of America. So, like I said, it took us a while to hit us. But eventually, when we, we got over all the comedy and, and, and yeah. faced reality, we knew that this, this was detrimental to our development. Yeah. Um, I actually would like to poll the audience after, to, you know, after going through all these sessions. Um, yes or no question. So given the opportunity for yourself or for your organization or your movement, would you recommend working with this new administration? Um, and we can, I'd love to ask the panel as well, but you know, yes or no, as a show of hands, um, you're going to go back and say it's important for us to continue working with a U.S. government. Yes? And then no? So almost nobody. Wow. So Miriam, I'd love to ask. Oh. So Miriam, I'd love to ask you, I mean, does that surprise you in any way? I mean, I think anybody raised, no one raised their hand. Maybe one or two did, but most people said they're willing to work with yes, this administration. Of, yes, of course. Yeah, you can't say that you don't want to work with this new administration. Uh, I think it's uh, that you should see a difference between activism and um, politics, diplomacy, and especially if you are more kind of diplomat, you have to work with people you don't like. And that it's very important that we have to work for the next couple of years 
uh, on our own organizations that we can build uh, on our organization, that we can make sure that there will be a uh, new, or that there will be an organization um, when Mr. Trump will uh, leave office. I don't know when, but maybe one day. Um, so yes, you have to work together with him. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, do you all agree? Yep. Okay. Um, I wanted to take, oh, was there a question? Absolutely, so there is breaking news. Um, I guess um, it's been confirmed that uh, Trump picked a new Secretary of State who is the current CEO of ExxonMobil, um, who has supposed ties to Russia and that um, John Bolton will be the, I think, dep un undersecretary is what they're saying. J John Bolton, right? Yep. Um, so I guess, I mean, maybe Cliff would love to hear or others. I mean, any initial reactions on, based on what you just said about we have to wait and see, I mean, how does that kind of calculate some of that for you? I, I, I think it's, it's really clear yeah. that, uh, you know, among a number of probably not good choices for SOGI issues, uh, that we didn't get a, 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 the one who was chosen was not, let's say, the least SOGI friendly. Um, did I get, no, it was not the most SOGI friendly. Um, and so I, I just think that we have to start planning f from now, if we haven't done it already, for how we engage strategically in a world in which U.S. policy cannot be counted on to be, a support, to be supportive. So I actually wanted to ask Clifton, you as well, like I'd like to maybe just go around and do a US, European, African, Latin American kind of um, move here. So first, I mean, um, from the World Bank, I know you have a big role there right now, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts, considering it's somewhat of a conservative organization if we consider the spectrum. Um, what does it mean to have representation and how do you think it's gonna change and you know, what, what role do you think it's gonna play moving forward? Anybody who doesn't know, I mean, the World Bank is a multilateral institution. It's not a formally part of the UN system. It was created pre-UN at the end of World War II uh, to rebuild Europe, to help rebuild Europe, uh, and now mainly engages in low-income and middle-income countries. And it's a financing uh, organization, and, and we have financing tools. Uh, and so it's really, really important that a political decision was made at the highest levels of this institution by Jim Kim, who's the president of the World Bank and his senior managers, to have a SOGI advisor. And the whole, the, the grounding in that is that they see a need for ensuring that LGBTI people, queer people, are a part of the thinking, part of the analysis, and the bank's goals of assisting countries in reaching sustainable development under the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are now in place and will be in place as the goals for all of our countries for the next 15 years to 2030. So it's really extremely important that the bank has this role, uh, that I'm able to fill that role, but it's gonna be a lot of work. So the important thing about the bank at the end of the day is exactly how it's using its money how it's using its voice with governments in terms of partnership for how that money gets used. Uh, we are talking about billions of dollars, so it's really important that we are a part of that uh, as much as we can be in overtime everywhere. Uh, and so that's gonna be a big thing that I'm engaged in is that advocacy for changing mindsets within the bank. They're economists, they're bankers, they're conservative, yes, mostly, uh, but there are lots of opportunities too. Next is to Miriam. We talked a little bit earlier just today about the European perspective. There's a lot of similar nationalist movements happening there, and yet we've seen this before in Europe, um, and unfortunately it's happening in somewhat of a pattern, if you will. So, you know, any lessons that you think we can bring back from the past that could be really effective today, or anything you've seen in Europe that people think might, it might be interesting to kind of take note of? Mm. I think... Uh... The lesson we can learn from this is that we don't learn much from history. That, that's a problem. Um, yeah, it's true. We see history repeating itself. It feels like kind of uh, the days of the Weimar Republic uh, in Germany. And I think that many people will say, wow, it's not that bad, that was worse. But if you read newspapers from that time, you will see that a lot of people also said, well, 
okay, something will change, but um, it will be not that bad. We can't predict what will happen, and that's the problem. But what we do see is that it's not just an American problem, because we see the same situation happening in many other European countries. We have uh, Boris Johnson in, uh, in the UK. We have Marie Le Pen in uh, France. Uh, we have Geert Wilders in the Netherlands. And uh, I'm from the Netherlands, but I can tell you that when, uh, when we will have elections in March in the Netherlands, Geert Wilders will get a lot of votes. That's absolutely sure. And maybe he will not um, be part of the new Dutch government, but then he will still be influential. Uh, we already see that in Europe at the moment, that European countries hesitate to uh, say things that are more LGBTI friendly because they are afraid of what the people of other countries will say. That they will say, oh, this is typical uh, the EU, what we see here. Um, so so that, that, that's a way larger problem than just the U.S. here, and um, that is what troubles me most at the moment, that it's really global. Um, moving to maybe the global south, um, Ricky, you know, we talked a bit earlier today that, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe, this has been going on for decades. There's a potential for change uh, uh, of hands of power, but would love to hear kind of where you've seen some examples in Zimbabwe or sub-Saharan Africa about dealing with... Um, dealing in countries that don't have a recourse for justice, don't have government support, don't have police protection. I know you've been an amazing champion and advocate, and we'd love to hear some of your, your lessons and what you've been able to, to come through in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Um, well, just going back to, to Mariam's point, um, America as the superpower of, of the world <clears throat> is seen as a leader, is seen as, 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 as uh, the champion of human rights, and um, the supply of money. Um, I, I won't beat about, beat about the bush. I mean, we, we rely heavily on funding from the from, from, uh, from United States through people like, through PEPFAR, um, the Global Fund, um, USAID, USA, USA, and all these people. Um, and um, to get back to your question, the, uh, our, our, our methods of survival have actually been uh, creating allies. And these allies have been regional, they've been international, um, they've been cross-country, um, they have been continental. <clears throat> and that is, that's our best form of, of survival. Uh, and to, to consider what's going on now and the, the, the possible threats that we face with, with the change in administration um, uh, um, of the US um, is a huge, 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 huge worry as far as we're concerned um, um, in, in Zimbabwe and, and actually I think the whole of Africa, um, so to speak. So it really, is, it really is a big worry. And then to Jael as well, I mean, we talked about Central America and the Caribbean having um, a really incredible difficult time with outside influence from both the African nations as well as the Christian right influencing a lot of what's happening. And I know you've had a, a couple of experiences in that and, you know, do you think it's, you know, with these new elections, I mean, there's, there's really a champion for those causes of the religious right and, and, and Africa to kind of dig in deeper and have you seen some, some ways that we've been able to kind of counterbalance that in, in Central American countries? Um, I, I think in regards to that, I, I've always been one to try and find the, the, the positive and negatives. Um, and there's, there's been a statement throughout the entire campaign that I, I completely hate, which is make America great again. I hate that statement because personally, I believe coming from Central America, coming from the Caribbean, um, and maybe I should run for politics here, but I believe America has always been great. And why I say, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I got two votes already. And, <laughs> and why I say America has always been great is because I, I believe in the principle that if you, are, if you are good at what you're doing, there's always a learning lesson. And one thing I take away from the election and, and, and the possible um, shifts in leadership is the fact that 
there is a lesson there to learn. Um, within the Caribbean and within the, the Central American region, we've been lobbying, yes, at grassroots. We've been lobbying, yes, at the United Nations. But what happened in this election shows that we need to be equally lobbying with capital to ensure that structures are in place no matter who is the leader of your country, right. that it will be in place and it will be followed. The systems will be there. The leader will not change it in a day. So it will take a while. And, and a lesson learned is the fact that we are advocates. We've changed minds and hearts throughout the world. We've changed the image of HIV. We've changed the image to an extent of LGBT people. So we can change the image and mind of whoever takes over America the Great. It's as simple as that. So we just need to work with the, the, the capital that we have and, and make it happen. And then Tatik, I think one of the most uh, amazing things that maybe even I didn't anticipate is the impact of social media, the, the, the fourth arm. And we're seeing it today with a, a person who's using it to bully individuals. Um, we're seeing it used for lots of good and lots of bad, unfortunately, as well. And I'd love to get your perspective of you know, how can we start channeling social media in the right way? Because we have seen some really great examples. I'd love to hear your thoughts around both the impact of that fourth wall um, and where we can kind of uh, learn to do better. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, I think we all understand that, you know, the media has had a huge effect on the outcome of this election. And, you know, this uh, invention of this fake news and what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. And I think this is, this is what happens when we have um, this really, like, open, almost like democratic access to creating news, right? When everyone, you know, can become, um, you know, um, a content creator and a journalist in their own right. You know, it just takes, you know, one quick witty quip that can go viral and all of a sudden 10,000 people are, you know, believing that, you know, I don't know, Hillary Clinton is a part of a child sex ring in Washington, D.C. Because I just read that and 14% of the people who voted for Donald Trump actually believe that, right? So I think for, for those of us who work in media, um, we have to be more discerning about uh, the content that we're putting out and also holding people accountable and making sure that our fact check is on point um, and also you know making sure that we're not scared to have these difficult conversations so I think moving forward we really have to be much more concerned about what the media is because the media isn't just about documenting what's happening in the culture it is what creates the culture right and so now we have to understand the culture that this media has created like this dichotomy of culture in the United States we are literally having two different uh, United States it's so ironic even to say that the United States <laughs> you know so right now we're having like two very different cultures that are percolating in this in, in, in this country and the undercurrent of that is the media and is the news um, so um, and also what I also understand is that when we're thinking about like you're saying like changing the hearts and minds right we change the hearts and minds so that we can change the culture and then we change the policies and then we change the laws right and a part of this this changing of the culture and the hearts and minds happens with our media so I think moving forward those of us who work in the media those of us who are ingesting the media have to hold more people accountable have to kind of you know put the mirror up to ourselves and challenge ourselves to get out of our echo chambers and start to fact check and see what other people are talking about so we could come to a place that feels like truth and come to a place that feels like unification instead of so much divisiveness to just pause and actually open up the audience for a bit for anybody who might have some questions now. Well, I'll go back to asking some questions to you guys, but um, any, any questions that anyone would like to ask now um, specifically? I think if I'm following up on that same media issue, the problem we've had with media is media has moved from a fact-based yeah. institution to an opinion-based institution. So everybody is now returned to their individual bubbles. If you're a left-wing nut, you listen to CNBC. If you're a right-wing nut, you listen to Fox News. And everybody's pushing their own agenda. So what is happening is nobody's listening to each other. And everybody's going to that individual hiding place. And it's creating that issue. So we, we as a people are no longer debating ideas. We are no longer discussing with things, with people. And that is why the thing with Trump caught people off guard because you literally had, if you paid attention to even Facebook, everybody was like, if you support Trump, get off my page. Instead of saying, let me try and convince you not to vote for Trump. Let me try and figure out what is your reason for voting for Trump. So I think we have to look at ourselves as individuals, how we approach each other. Uh, yeah. Um 
I, I definitely agree. But, and also, I think that, you know, propaganda has always been a proponent of our media, you know what I'm saying, and of our news. This is something that has been happening, you know, since since the news has been happening. But, you know, because of social media and because it moves so fast and because of the globalization is creating a smaller world, we're, we're, we're constantly, uh, you know, exchanging this misinformation, you know. Um, and to that point, I hear you, but for me, you know, when you have someone who, excuse my language, said he could just grab women by the pussy, you know, we have someone who is accused of raping a 13-year-old girl, we have someone who has built their platform on really racist, violent rhetoric, and then you vote for this person, and you said that this racism and, and, and sexism is not a deal breaker for you, but then you are a deal breaker for me. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing left for us to talk about. Uh, just to jump off that same conversation also, um, with the control that the media has, there's also a control that the tech companies have that control how we access the media. And so how do we kind of bring this ideology into that as well, where the algorithms that uh, structure how we search for things or what actually shows up on certain news, news feeds is inherently uh, reinforcing this dichotomous uh, situation that we're in. I mean, I can say a, a bit about that as well. Um, I, I think you're right, absolutely. I mean, and I think one of the things that might be interesting, I'd love to actually hear from you guys as well, is I was talking to somebody earlier today about um, what's now going to be the outsized importance of corporations. And you saw what happened in North Carolina, and you see the impact that they could have in policy. And so I think when they want to be a magnet for talent, they want to start becoming a part of a larger social good movement, you are starting to see slowly this um, impact on the bottom line of actually being you know, divisive and not inclusive. And you're seeing it impacting them in that way. Um, and so I, I, I'm curious to see if that actually starts impacting. We saw what happened on Facebook with you know, the outrage around fake media. And I think both Google and Facebook recently decided around you know, not promoting ads um, on fake news uh, out outlets and stuff like that. So they're making prog they're making steps. It's not all the way there, but I, I I do feel that there's something happening there, at least from my perspective. Yeah. Get on in a, in a bit. I don't want to discuss the issue of algorithms in the internet because I have no I, I know nothing about that. But what I do want to say is that for all the organizations that many of you represent, um, whether you're working at the local level, the national level, the regional level, or the global level, like Outright Action itself. One of the best strategies we can employ for responding to this whole cluster of issues that you all have been, that we've been discussing, is really just making sure that we're collecting data about our communities and about how we're either excluded or included, uh, whether it's media and communications or various aspects of life like education and health, economic opportunity, et cetera, rights. We collect that data, we want analysis of that data, and we want to use that evidence base for the messages we're putting out. That's going to be the most effective. It won't always win the day, but ultimately it'll be one of the most effective strategies for countering some of this. Uh, one last question, yep. Um, my question is more towards the Southern Ricky and uh, Jael. Um, one of the things that that I that we've seen in, in and I can only speak about Africa because that's where I come from is the way in which the media plays a really really detrimental role in um, the LGBTI uh, issue in the sense that it's utilized very effectively by the government, very effectively by anti-LGBTI uh, people to try to incite violence and incite action against the LGBTI community. And it's often used to, um, uh, so L the LGBTI community is often used as, uh, is instrumentalized by the governments uh, when they're going to vote or, you know, as the scapegoat for everything that's wrong. In fact, it's a joke there that if it if it hails or if something happens that, you know, it, that they say, well, blame it on the gays. Um, the, other, the other factor is that we come from a very patriarchal society. So in the same way where you're talking about Trump and his utterances 
around, you know, the disgusting utterances around women and all the rest of it. We have in South Africa Jacob Zuma, who has been accused of rape and all sorts of things, but that does not remove him from power, and it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and a lot of that goes to the patriarchal society where it's okay for men to do that because that is what men do. So, you know, I just wanted to know from maybe anyone on the panel, but I was mostly uh, looking at the Southerners, is why is it that given that we know that the media is so influential, um, that there's not enough proactive media work or media attacks because um, it, when you see stories on LGBTI people, it's often when somebody's been murdered, raped, or arrested, rather than us using the media to do what Cliff was saying earlier, is really to put forward you know, what the LGBTI community is about, what our successes are, uh, and all of that stuff. So it would be nice to get some thoughts. Thanks, Shanua. Um, yes, I, I do agree with you. Um, uh, the problem, one of the main problems that we have in, 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 in Africa, uh, in particular in, in Zimbabwe and all these um, anti-LGBTI co uh, countries is that the mainstream media is all government, um, they're, they're all pro-government. So it's very difficult to get stories that are, that are neutral let alone positive uh, when we speak uh, about the LGBTI community. But now to address that, speaking from the Southern Africa region, we have, we have formed um, under a program a citizen, journal, a citizen journalist um, uh, training, where we have now, we are now uh, starting our own, our own uh, reporting, our own documenting of of human rights abuses and positive stories as well, Shanila. So that's a way that we have found we can we can we can counter. We are owning our own stories and we are publishing our own stories. Um, Speaking to positive media, it's really difficult to find positive media in country, especially coming from Zimbabwe. We do have uh, one or two media houses that are independent, but they are also under an immense pressure from the government to not publish the stories that we want them to publish, which also calls into, in, into consideration the safety of the media houses, the safety of, of, of the editors, and the people that we actually are trying to report and we are trying to, 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 um, to support as well. So it really is a very, very difficult balancing act as to how do we get these positive stories out there without jeopardizing the lives of, of the, the editors and the reporters and the LGBT, uh, LGBTI community themselves. So it really is a difficult situation. Um, I hear what you're saying. We've tried for, for many, many years to, to overcome it. Um, when I was arrested two years ago, there was a huge media frenzy in, in, in the region. I couldn't, I couldn't leave my house for three weeks without being, um, without being, um, being attacked on the street, basically, because it was, it was really it was terrible. Um, so that is the impact of the negative um, media. I think it's important to go back to what every journalist learns as one of the first rules. Freedom of press is guaranteed only to those who own one. And that means that you need to have your own press, but especially here in the USA, we see that news has become a commercial product. So they listen to what the people want to hear, populism, and they will bring them that. And that, 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 that is part of the problem, I think. So you really have to work on your own press to make sure that you can communicate your own message. And that is something that many people here forgot, I think. Um, well, for us in Belize, and I can only speak on Belize, um, the media has been pretty much to, to this point now one of our best allies, um, namely because there has been a lot of, of um, NGOs who take up um, human rights, not LGBT rights, but who take up human rights, and have found a way to include LGBT um, sensitization in it. For instance, we had, um, I think it was two or three years ago, where um, Vanessa Champagne, she passed away, um, may she rest in peace, was brought across on the news as he, 
when she identifies as she. And w the LGBT community came together and they're like, no, her name is Vanessa Champagne. She identifies as she. So we went to the different media houses that portrayed Vanessa as a he, and they were very apologetic. They, they, they um, made their amendments, and, and we've had the media be our best ally to this point. Um, some of them do give stories because they are politically driven, but we use that political publicity. Um, for instance, we, we've also had, um, along the Orlando shooting, uh, a guy in Belize posted on his Facebook that something like that should happen in Belize so that it would cleanse out Belize. Um, we, the LGBT community, again, picked that up and we made an uproar out of it. And two days after, he was fired from his job. So we did not stop until something was done because he was speaking hate. He was technically telling everyone it's okay to go out there and do whatever you want to an LGBT person. And then again, there's a, a, a personal story for me. I had a, a, a back and forth with our deputy prime minister. Um, I was apparently awarded the Minister's Youth Award and because we published it on our Facebook page, um, he said we misrepresented his award. It was nothing for LGBT people. It's just for the work that I did with the military and people living with HIV. Um, so those four letters, L, G, B, and T, made the deputy prime minister of my country feel like he should go on Facebook. I guess he's influenced by, by he who shall not be called. Um, <laughs> went on Facebook and decided that he should have a back and forth with me on Facebook. Now, the media picked that up because what he did not realize was I have a lot of media friends on Facebook. As far as a UN reporter was on my Facebook. So he got called from Geneva asking, <laughs> what is the issue with this award? The day before the Trump election, he put a public apology on Facebook and made a new, uh, 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 News, uh, what, what do you call it, Mr. Newsman? <laughs> um, <laughs> press release, <laughs> yes. <laughs> he made a press release apologizing for it. Amazing. So to, to date, in Belize, I, I can say that the media has been our best friend. Of course, they have slip-ups. Um, we forgive them, they apologize, and we move on. That's but we great. do yeah. use them. Thank you. Uh, I think one last question, then we'll come back to some specific questions. Over here. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, some people would say that what we saw in the United States in this past couple of years is two capitalist uh, parties running against each other. And you, many of you, come from countries where uh, there are anti-capitalist uh, parties and uh, different systems for uh, economic development. And I'm wondering, uh, because I, for one, see the fact that ExxonMobil is now officially, <laughs> the officially in charge of state, in, you know, in a state policy for the United States. Uh, it's you know, it's not hidden anymore. It's it's the glove is off. Um, what do you see the international LGBTQI movement being able to do? to ally uh, ourselves with uh, something that goes against this particular very dangerous capitalist system? I think it's a really important question. I imagine it's gonna take some time for us to unpackage. Um, the reality is, and I actually wanna kind of piggyback off your question if you don't mind, um, which is, the importance of allies, uh, new and existing. We've heard it a couple of times throughout the day, and I would love to ask anybody here, um, especially because of the diversity on this panel, uh, both from your work and who you know who you represent. Um, how, how do you think that's going to happen and play out, or who are you going to seek out for your allies? Whether it's the intersex activism, the trans rights movement, would love to hear your thoughts around that. You know, honestly, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be frank here. I, I you know, I, I, don't really, I don't, I don't really know what, what is next. You know, it doesn't really feel hopeful. You know, what I'm saying, well, we have this administration of gazillionaires, right, who are obviously have 
um, their own agenda um, that is going to benefit them and the people of their ilk, right? Um, and then us as LGBT people who are on the front lines who are doing this work, we have always relied on our allies, and particularly allies within the administration of this country to make sure that, you know, uh, uh, you know anti-LGBT rhetoric is tempered, that uh, certain policies and procedures are, are put in place so that we are protected, right? Um, so even if this administration does nothing against us, it's not going to do anything for us. You know, I'm worried that, you know, the hateful rhetoric that is happening, particularly against transgender women, transgender women of color, is going to be allowed to continue to happen, which is going to show an uptick in violence. You know, so I really so, don't see how or our, how we are going to create allies okay. um, within this in, new administration and how to get our work to uh, another sure. level. A cliff? Uh, I come from a bank now, so you're not going to hear me say anything against the capitalist system. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what I what I will say is that uh, that it's going to be important moving forward that we as uh, the LGBTI community and the folks we represent and our different organizations and institutions pivot quickly from the, uh, you know, woe is us. It's going to be a horrible situation. It is. Uh, let's, I mean, it compared especially to what we've had from Europe and the U.S. and some others over the last few years, uh, it's going to be a much more challenging situation. We have to pivot quickly to where are the opportunities that we need to move on? Because that's how our community has always been able to move. And we can't ignore the fact that we can still do that. So I was quickly looking to see about ExxonMobil. Uh, and I note that ExxonMobil finally in this year, 2016, became one of the multinationals that is giving full protection to its LGBTI employees. So that's a hopeful sign. It doesn't mean that that's necessarily now going to be the way State Department policy follows. But two things, one for federal employees, which is about tone. We're going to have to see if more broadly in the new government, they try to change what's in place now for protections for LGBTI employees of, of, the, of, of the federal government. Um, and especially that they're not being witch hunted, right, which is a, a, a risk. The other one is, uh, it, are these businessmen who are now going to be running political affairs, international affairs for the U.S. government, are they not going to be bringing a socially conservative agenda with them? And what I was referring to earlier is that, and I, I think I garbled it, we had the risk of getting appointments in the international sphere who came with socially conservative agendas. At least this particular Secretary of State nominee seems not to. And hopefully we need to see how that plays out in terms of the head of USAID, the executive director for my organization from the US for the World Bank, et cetera. I, but I, at the end of the day, I think there will still be opportunities for moving positive agendas, absolutely with allies, and we need to be watching for those and make, moving our strategies based on that. Uh, again, Ricky, would love to hear your thoughts. I mean, you know, this isn't a new phenomenon for Zimbabwe, and you know, what allies do you rely on? Has your movement kind of looked to to help? Uh, okay. Uh Oh, the, the greatest ally that, that we have had, um, um, speaking personally, has been the Canadian, the Canadians. They've been a, a great ally of, of my organization. Uh, but in speaking regionally, we have got a huge support from the Global Fund. Um, we have a huge grant, uh, which is supporting the, the trans movement in the region. And that is, that's the core funding that we do have. And again, we're looking to, to, to the US um, for that funding to, to, to um, maintain the growth of our movement, which has grown in leaps and bounds, I must say, in the, last eight, in the last 18 months. But like I said in my opening remarks, this is now the worry that we have. Um, we've come this far. How much further do we have to go? under the new administration. That's the question that we have to ask. And it's so, it's so encouraging to hear what, what, uh, what Cliff is saying about, um, uh, about what, what the possibilities are. And we just hope, and we certainly keep our fingers crossed, that we can navigate our way through the, 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 what's, coming, what's coming towards us. Um, in the discussion I hear now, it sometimes looks like that you are afraid that you don't have access to people in power. Um, and maybe that's right, maybe you are not. But that doesn't mean that you can't 
use your power to work on those people. Um, I'm from an intersex group, and I can tell you, no intersex group in Europe has real access to their governments. So we are in that situation for a long time now, maybe 50 years. Yet, we were able to, um, to change things. And we used the United Nations for that. Because the governments were not listening to us. So we went to the United Nations, uh, used uh, treaty bodies, uh, used everything we could use to make sure that some complaints of us went to, let's say, the European Parliament or the Council of Europe. And people were listening there. And that, we used that to build on pressure on our governments. And that worked too. So now we see something change without having access to our own governments. And maybe that might be a solution for you too. It, it has another um, advantage actually we noticed because um, when you are an intersex person and you ask for help, let's say that you say to your doctor, well, I want to see other intersex people, then he may or she may or may not say, yeah, I can help you. But in that case, you are dependent you have to depend on that person. And maybe you can then have a peer support group. Maybe. And maybe that peer support group can have access to schools to tell other people that you want to change something. But then you have to rely on those schools. It will they give you access to those schools, to the pupils. Um, if you go the other way around, if you start at United Nations, then you will see that it will result in legislation. And that legislation will influence the people. If you go up bottom up, then you are working on integration. And you will see that in our case, intersex people are still a separate group in society. But if you go top down, top down then you work on inclusion, which is a lot better. So maybe you can learn something from what we are doing at the moment is the intersex community. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, you know, one thing I think that really brought to my mind was, is this an opportunity for other member states, other organizations to pick up the mantle, if you will? And, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts around that if you think there's gonna be a power shift away from the US potentially. Um. I think, yes, it is an opportunity. Um, and again, I speak, of course, on Belize because we've had our first ever pride flag raised for a pride event this year. Um, unfortunately, it was not locals or, or Belizeans that did it. It was with the support of the US Embassy, who has actually been our biggest supporters uh, um, in Belize in regards to advancing um, LGBT inclusion. Um, so while we have US Embassy, we have our, our British Embassy that is there who is pretty much invisible in regards to, to LGBT work. We have, we have, again, our Mexican Embassy. These are big embassies in Belize that have big positions in the United Nations. And they're seeing the, the, the advancement. They're seeing Belize's will to move on. And, and I keep saying Belize's will because it's, 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 it's a rough position for Belize because we've seen where the government is progressive. The government does want change, but the government has the, the, the position where it, it chooses to please the people or please the churches. Because the church, they're very influential in Belize. And I keep telling people, I, I, I come from a military background, and I, I've been afforded five days to be here from the Minister of Defense. And that's not coming out of my leave, coming out of anything, I've been sent here. So I believe the government is progressing. We've 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 voted yes for the, the independent expert. We've 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 gotten agreements that they're willing to work towards, but they're trying to find a balance in regards to to, to what to do. And I think having 
embassies and, and, and influence from the United Kingdom and Mexico in our country, they, they, they should be doing more. They, 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 they should be, be more vocal and move forward in regards to, to inclusion because they're, they're working towards inclusion in their own countries. So they have tools set up already that can be shared with us. And then, of course, we do have the, the, the EU who we, we still need to see more from them. So I think this is a time now for those, those bigger nations to step up and say, OK, maybe we're not overthrowing America, if I can say that. <laughs> but we are making a way that we can, we can actually be more visible and more, more vocal in what's happening. Uh, just to pick it, pick it back, back on what what has been saying, um, what we found in Zimbabwe is um, speaking to allies. Besides the Americans, we have very good working relationship with the with the with the Netherlands, the Netherlands embassy, and with the Swedish embassy as well. Um, the British, like you say, tend to be a bit um, uh, not too forthcoming, but we have. Made, made huge strides. Um, the Netherlands Embassy have, have um, for the last two years, supported our Ida Hot uh, um, celebrations in Zimbabwe. They've been the main funder, they've provided us with, um, with the venue, so, so, we, so we have made other allies. And looking forward, should, should um, the assistance that we have been receiving from the Americans um, start dwindling, uh, we have to look obviously to people like, like, the, like the Europeans. Um, just to speak to a point that um, Miriam raised earlier on, it would be really difficult for us to look to the African, African Commission, for example, who is our sort of governing body um, in the, on the continent. Uh, given the fact that the African Commission are completely against any LGBT, LGBTI issues. Um, the Coalition of African Lesbians had been awarded last year observer status at, at the African Union, which has since been overturned. So that's, so we've, we've, we've taken a step back, you know, on, on the African continent. So these are, the, these are the, 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 the dynamics with which we, we have to operate. And it's, um, for me, sitting in New York, it's it's very easy to say, okay, are we no, we can do we can do uh, uh, A B C D, but on the ground, it really is difficult. Um, speaking to to back to the media, for example, in Zimbabwe, we have we have what's what's uh, called um, the Post and Telecommunications Act, which actually governs the media. Uh, what's published, what's not published, what, what stations, what's broadcast. So it really is a difficult, difficult situation in which we operate. Directly to the question, I think, yeah, absolutely, this is the time for us to build those alliances and create stronger connections uh, with other uh, SOGI, if you will, friendly countries. So my own institution, the World Bank, is owned by its government shareholders. The U.S. is the largest shareholder, but unlike after World War II when it was 100% shareholder, it's now only 18 or 19%. The rest are owned by a multitude of other countries that contribute to the, the bank's coffers. Um, and we have within that a number that are very SOGI friendly on the executive board, including co program countries, that is countries from middle income or even low income countries, Latin America, Asia, et cetera, uh, and South Africa. Uh, and so uh, beyond the World Bank sphere, I mean, that really, keep in mind that the largest funder, so the U.S. has been a big voice during the Obama administration on policy in LGBT inclusion, but beyond that, the funding, the, the Dutch are the largest by far funders of civil society for SOGI work. Uh, there's no question. Depending on how you cut it, the next down is the US, Sweden, Norway. Um, and so we have other funders as well. The real key will be to make sure that we can fill that policy voice that we've been hearing for the last four to six years from the Obama administration at your, in your country level, where you have embassies supporting local groups to make sure they're included in dialogues, giving them visibility, giving them a platform, helping them with that. Um, so maybe some of our colleagues who are here from civil society organizations in the Netherlands, in Norway, in Sweden, relative to the EU, even the UK, and any others, 
uh, we really need some, some, some lobbying to get this more prominently on the agenda of those governments that are already engaged with, engaged with dollars on SOGI work in lots of other countries. And then the last thing I'll s simply say is the list of allies goes well beyond these countries that provide money to the UN system and to some of you. It's also a long list of Latin American countries over the last few years. Very positive on SOGI issues, both often domestically and certainly at the UN level. And even a number of Asian countries, some of the quiet ones like Japan, so we have to keep our eye on those kinds of alliances that need to be built, um, and, and as I said, importantly, in, in, the, in, in, in the African continent, South Africa. So we have lots of other allies that we need to be focusing on. Thank you. Uh, Teek, I, I want to ask one more question and then throw it back to the audience. Um, so Teek, you know, who, who do you think is or maybe will become a disruptive and yet positive voice moving forward, whether it's in the media or outside? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, a positive or disruptive voice? Um, I think it's really the voice of the people. The voice of the people has always been a disruption to the status quo, has always been a, a disruption to the, to the establishment. Um, and I think it's important for the people to be able to use social media um, uh, in their in their advancement in our advancement of our issues in the equality that we are trying to achieve, um, I can't really think of one person that's going to, to to do this because the task ahead is so multifaceted, right? Uh, this isn't a single issue. We don't live we don't live single issue lives. So there is a there's a multiplicity of issues that we have to that we have to um, address. And I think what's going to happen, you know, someone said to me that with great crisis comes great opportunity, and I'm hoping that. What's going to happen out of this election and the current climate that we're in is that people from all different um, walks of advocacy life, whether it's uh, racial justice, whether it's um, gender and feminism, whether it's LGBTQI issues, that we can come together and have a, a better, more fine-tuned inter intersectional approach to the work that we're doing in order to combat the things that are, are definitely going to come our way. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick. I had wanted to ask about a comment that Miriam had brought up, and actually the, an earlier panel, another Ricky from the Free and Equal campaign had brought up, which basically was the talking about this idea of there are people out there who are not hating of Soji rights, but are indifferent, right? They allow the they allow other priorities to happen and the free and equal campaign works really hard to get those people to care um so right now a lot of us are we talk about this echo chamber so my question really is how one do we break out of this echo chamber how do we reach out to those people maybe not the people who are like against soji rights especially the united states but people who are indifferent and how do we make them care so for people, for the ones of you who are from other countries who have to do that on a daily basis, how do you care? And for people who are in the United States, how should we change you, um, United States um, LGBTI advocacy so that we can make sure that we are not just speaking to ourselves, but actually convincing other people and really making sure that they're hearing that message and coming on board so that this doesn't continue to happen? Hmm. Okay. often we are preaching to the choir. And that's a problem. Um, in Europe, we tried to work on a um, um, project that was aimed at the movable middle. And the first problem we had is, what is the movable middle? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it was almost impossible to find a real answer to that question. So. That already gives you an idea how difficult it is to reach out to that movable middle. And uh, actually, in my opinion, no one of us found a, an answer that was usable. Mm -hmm. um, so I can say, yes, it is a problem. What I do is that I don't only go to meetings like this. I love to be here, actually, but I think that I often prefer to speak to uh, to even a national political party because you can find a lot of friends there, unexpected friends. Um, and then they realized, indeed, that they were simply not thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, the session is titled Towards a Manifesto for the Trump Years, and it's very intriguing that you begin by quoting Martin Luther King, right? The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So I was only curious about whether you take it one step further, 
and say we need to rethink our strategies as well. The key contribution to Martin Luther King, obviously, is the idea of civil disobedience. And that comes in a sense, I mean, the, the best practitioner is Gandhi. It comes to Martin Luther King. The history goes back to Thoreau, which again is part of the American tradition. So really, in a sense, can you take the idea of civil disobedience more seriously and develop a different strategy in the time going forward? And that connects up to, I think, what Tick in particular was saying, where you need a wider sense of what the political moment is. Because I don't, at least my analysis would be, I don't think people were stupid and bigoted necessarily in, in voting the way they did. But it comes out of a certain kind of economic immeasurization, comes out of a certain way in which we didn't recognize the horrors which globalization has perpetrated, right? So uh, it calls for a wider intersectional politics, calls for strategies founded on going back to traditions this country knows very, very well, and taking forward those ideas. So I, I think the manifesto is still not emerged, and that's a work which still needs to happen, actually. Uh, yeah, I agree. We definitely have to have um, an, inter an intersectional approach, and then thinking about that and like this idea of the movable middle, which is becoming like um, less and less distinct, right? There's more of this, this dichotomy that we're living in, um, and, and so I think moving forward, having an intersectional approach to appealing to people's like shared sense of community, of family, uh, and of justice, right? Um, but the problem with that is that we're moving to a space now. How can I how can I appeal to this shared sense? of value and love and justice when you don't even see me as a human being, right? When you don't even believe that I have a right to exist as a trans person, as a trans person of color, as an LGBTI person, like what, what does that look like? So I think that that is, a, that is a huge issue that we're having right now, whereas people don't even, that, you know, people don't even believe that we even have the audacity to exist um, in our skin. But the thing is, is that it's possible. Um, you know, um, there's a stat that I always give when I do my, my media trainings. Um, in 1992, 27% of people said that they knew somebody that was gay or lesbian, right? And only about 20 people uh, agreed that marriage equality should happen, that the gay and lesbian people should get married, right? So then we fast forward to 2013, where over 50% of people know someone that is gay or lesbian, and over 50% of people now um, are for marriage equality. So it's really about us being able to have like an interpersonal connection with people when we're talking about building our allies, our, our allyship. And sometimes it, it, you know, it pains me and it frustrates me that you know we, we have to call in all these other allies, particularly like cisgender and heterosexual allies, in order for people to understand our value as a human being. But like this is where we are, and 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 this is one of the strategies that have worked before. Yeah, um, yeah. just a, a question, maybe it's too late for asking this, but uh, what I'm hearing once and again is that we are keeping our trust in a, in a global system uh, based on states as the key actors of that system. And at the same time, we are talking all the time about corporations that are transnational, multinational corporations. So in the case of my country in Argentina, I can say the government is powerful, but honestly, Monsanto and now Bayer, they are this more power there. And when we talk about the media, we can talk about a particular newspaper, a particular journalist, but what we are seeing is media, big pharma, mining uh, companies uh, acting at the same time as big states in themselves not regulated by state laws or the UN. So I'm really, you know, uh, worried, I tend to worry too much sometimes, but uh, if we are using a paradigm that is becoming uh, old for the kind of challenges that we have ahead, if we are trusting a lot in the capacity to nation states of governments to, defi to def uh, defend our interests, and actually uh, Trump's victory shows that not even the Republican Party or the democratic uh, system in the U.S. can stop corporations to get into power in a very literal way. So are we missing the sign uh, of, of these times there? That's, that's one the part of the question. The other question is that I have been coming to the, to the U.S. for many times and I'm always surprised about the lack of interest in radical movements in the state to, to uh, talk with their own government, to pay attention to what's going on at the federal level. So uh, is this, do you think that this is going to change? Because um, sometimes in other countries we have a very close relationship and even a challenging relationship with the government. And Sometimes here, the answer is, well, actually, we don't care about what's going on in D.C. And right now, what is going on in D.C. could end the world for everyone. So, <laughs> yeah.
So, uh, I, and, uh, thank you, Mato. The, the, the first part, I think, well, I would, I would say it's neither an either, neither or, but I think you've put your finger on something that's important in terms of the changing ecosystem that we have to deal with uh, in terms of uh, alliance building and, and moving agendas. And that is, I don't think we can abandon the idea of the nation state and the UN system because it's there and it's not going anywhere and it wields a lot of power in our lives, whether we see it directly or not. Um, and so we have to stay engaged on that. But I think you're right. There's a whole other part of evolution of where power lies and how decisions get made, including at the political level, that have to do with multinationals, that have to do with media conglomerates that cross borders. Uh, and so I think those are newer, they're not brand new, but they're newer locuses of power that we have to address in some strategic, planned out, thought out way. Uh, and and, I, and I, I think that that's going to be a challenge for us if we haven't done a lot of that before. Um, in addition to my human rights work, I'm a school teacher. I work here in New York City with inner city kids and a lot of new immigrants from West Africa, specifically young girls who are wearing hijabs. And I have seen an increase of hate crimes amongst my students and my children. Children learn this by adults. They don't inherently understand what hate is. And this correlates to, I believe, 600% increase in hate crimes in New York City alone. And so I'm very concerned for my kids. They're all my kids, wherever they come from, what they look like. And I'm just curious, primarily for the opinion of the non-US-based panelists, but the US-based panelists, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. Do you see that this perception of condoned behavior which is where this is coming from. These children somehow believe by the name that shall not be said, somehow propagates this or condones this behavior. Do you believe that this could carry over on a global level? As you said, we sneeze in the States, maybe the world gets a cold, might be broader. Well, first I'll start off with the, in the Caribbean, we believe in a good old ass whooping, so you'll get that for one. But um, <laughs> in, in, in regards to, to lessons learned, um, I actually had a, a discussion with, with Kendra from Jamaica. Um, she wasn't feeling well, so she left. Yesterday when we were entering the UN building, I think there was like a school trip or something. Um, and I think there were like four of us in the line and a guy probably a little taller than me, but really young, just pushed past us and we were like, what, what, what is this? And the other one laughed and I kid you not, because I turned around and I guess I started talking to Kendra slightly um, faster because we understand each other. Um, and he was like, um, I, I think he, he mentioned something about, um, um, I think there was some lady that was pushed down a, a, a set of stairs or something. And I'm not too familiar, but this was the first time I was hearing the, the, the story at the, um, the, the UN building. And I'm, I'm thinking what, it, it, it's not what is thought or what is said by, by he who shall not be named or whatever he, he promotes. I think it goes back again to media as to how the media perceives it or how the media puts it out. Because if, it, if media is condoning it or, or, or to the sense lightening what is being done, because I know you mentioned about grabbing women by the crutches, it, it, rather than bringing that as a serious issue, it was mostly put across in media as a joke. And I think that is where we have the, the, the responsibility to not only call out those who are violating us in, in, in those remarks, but we need to really lock down on media itself. Because if they would have portrayed that as a serious issue, then I believe that that would not have been trickled down like a joke. Because one thing I know um, that we started having like a, a, a big amount of was um, leaked sex tapes in the Caribbean, for instance. And people found it funny to, to, to just share these videos of people they knew and, and, and everything like that. But when we took to the media and we started explaining what were the federal 
um, charges that could be that could be crossed uh, on someone who is sharing these video, what they could lose and everything. That took a completely different turn. So I think again it goes back to media and and how the media portrays it because that's brought that has brought up a lot of discussion in 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 our region. Just just the fact of using was the word he used pussy or something. That that was a big thing for us having pussy across media. I mean, it, that's censored for us. So I think it goes back to how it's portrayed, and of course it goes back to what we stand for. So I, I, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, so unfortunately we're out of time, but everyone agreed that they're gonna stay a little bit afterwards and would love to take any questions. I, I apologize, I think we're running behind, so I'm sorry. But I just wanted to say thank you very much to the panel. You know, really great um, time here, so thank you so much for, for, for it. Thanks again to the audience, and outright, have a good rest of the day.